To understand the structure of the placenta, it helps to understand the structure of a blastocyst. Here is a blastocyst implanting, starting implantation. This is the endometrium. This would be the uterine cavity. And as you can see, if you take a look at the structure of the blastocyst, it's made up of two parts. There are these outer red cells. Those are the trophoblast cells. And then there's this clump of cells inside of that hollow spherical trophoblast cells called the inner cell mass. The trophoblast cells will give rise to the placenta, whereas the inner cell mass is going to give rise to the organism. Once the blastocyst contacts the endometrium and starts implanting in the endometrium, the trophoblast differentiates into two regions. Here we can see this yellow area is known as the syncytial trophoblast. The syncytial trophoblast is a region that's first contacting the endometrium and it's aggressively burrowing into the endometrium. What happens here is that the trophoblast cells lose their boundaries. In other words, they merge together so that each one of these circular structures is a nucleus. So this is a multi-nucleated cytoplasmic mass that's aggressively digging its way into the endometrium. At the same time, there re remains a layer of individual trophoblast cells that retain their cell boundaries that surround the hollow cavity, the blastocyst cavity, and the inner cell mass. And that region is known as the cellular or the cytotrophoblast. As implantation proceeds, we can see that the syncytial trophoblast and the cellular trophoblast continue to grow and implantation is not complete until the conceptus is completely buried within the endometrium. Here we can see some of the surface epithelium from the endometrium starting to uh, regenerate or cover the tracks where the conceptus entered the endometrium. In addition to aggressively uh, invading the endometrium, the syncytial trophoblast is doing something else that we can't see. It's producing a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. HCG is the pregnancy hormone that is going to sustain the life of the corpus luteum. It's going to sustain the life of the corpus luteum so that progesterone levels remain high. Taking a quick look at that, you can see that as soon as the trophoblast forms in the blastocyst, even prior to implantation, HCG levels are increasing and they uh, rapidly increase at the start of the pregnancy. And then you can see the sharp decline in HCG levels, and that's at about uh, the third month. And that's because the trophoblast gives rise to the placenta. Once the placenta forms at around this point, the placenta will start to secrete estrogen and progesterone, and so will no longer rely on the corpus luteum for those hormones. Taking a look at another picture, uh, what we can see here is that the inner cell mass is organized into an embryonic disc, and that embryonic disc is going to undergo gastrulation, where a new uh, cell layer called the mesoderm is going to be formed. But not all of the mesoderm is contained within the embryo, in this picture, they're showing us these cells, which are extra embryonic mesodermal cells. And what these mesodermal cells do is they line the cellular trophoblast. And once the mesoderm lines the cellular trophoblast, then we no longer use the terminology of trophoblast. Instead, now we're going to refer to all of these layers, the mesoderm, the cellular trophoblast, and the syncytial trophoblast as the chorion. Here we can see that the chorion continues to implant and invade the endometrium. As it does so, it creates these little cavities uh, known as lacuni. Those lacuni are filled with maternal blood from the damaged endometrium. And the way that the chorion is growing is outward in these extensions, kind of like roots of a plant, the conceptus is anchoring itself in the endometrium. These extensions are known as chorionic villi. And we can also see the pool of maternal blood that's starting to form around the chorionic villi. Uh, these spaces are known as the intervillous spaces. We see that the mesoderm has lined uh, this area as we talked about. And I just want to mention that the mesoderm will eventually 
give rise to blood vessels. And those blood vessels are going to um, eventually be responsible for blood flow to and from the conceptus. We can also see here how implantation is complete. Notice how the endometrium has regenerated and the endometrium completely contains the developing conceptus. In this picture, the uterine wall is over here and the uterine, uterine cavity, the hollow inside of the uterus is over here. Notice how the endometrium is still containing the offspring, but the offspring is starting to bulge from the surface of the endometrium. And because of that stress, take a look at the chorionic villi on this side where the offspring is starting to bulge into the lumen of the uterus. The chorionic villi are much smaller on that side compared to, you know, much more extensive over here where they're rooting into the uterine wall. And eventually what will happen as growth proceeds is the chorionic villi will only be located near the uterine wall, near the myometrium, compared to the chorionic villi that are projecting into the lumen of the uterine cavity, those eventually get stretched smooth and it becomes known as the smooth chorion. Let me show you. In this picture, we can see that the conceptus has grown so much that not only is it bulging from the surface of the endometrium, but it's uh, filling the uterine cavity and the uterus is expanding in size just to accommodate the offspring. And we can see how the chorionic villi are projecting into the endometrium and where the offspring is projecting into the lumen of the uterus, that that is known as the smooth chorion. Notice how the amnion in blue surrounds the offspring and eventually the amnion is gonna bump into and fuse to the smooth chorion and become known as the amniochorionic membrane. Let's take a closer look at the placenta. Here's a close-up view of the placenta. We can see the umbilical cord carrying the three umbilical blood vessels, the two umbilical arteries that are carrying deoxygenated blood away from the offspring to the placenta, and the one umbilical vein that's carrying oxygenated blood from the placenta back into the offspring. We can see how those blood vessels have formed inside of the chorionic villi, so these are still the chorionic villi, and we know that the chorionic villi are uh, digging into, rooting into the endometrium. Uh, let's take a look at that. This pool of blood, remember, that surrounds the chorionic villi is known as the intervillus space. And the intervillus space is part of what used to be known as the stratum functionalis, but now this portion of the endometrium is known as the decidua basalis. The decidua basalis is the maternal portion of the placenta and the chorionic villi are the fetal portion of the placenta. The placenta is in contact with the stratum basalis and that is still in contact with the myometrium. And so the placenta, keep in mind, is just an exchange between the mother and the offspring. The chorionic villi grow into the mother's endometrium, but the blood will never mix. You can think of the placenta as having two main jobs. One is exchange, exchange of blood gases supplying oxygen to the developing offspring so that oxygen would diffuse from its area of high pressure into its area of lower pressure into the offspring. And also nutrients and waste products are exchanged, but only these individual items are exchanged. Blood does not mix. The other main function of the placenta is it's an endocrine gland and secretes hormones. Estrogen and progesterone are secreted by the placenta, as well as human placenta lactogen, which causes maturation of the alveolar tissue, the breast tissue, in preparation for uh, milk production. And it also produces a hormone called relaxin, which softens the pubic symphysis, 